Let me introduce the speakers. We have um, first Dinesh D'Souza, who is the author of the forthcoming book, The Big Lie. He has produced and starred in Hillary's America and Obama's America. He has a 35-year career as a writer, scholar, and public intellectual, a former policy analyst in the Reagan White House. We have Ralph Benko from the Alinsky Center. Uh, president of the Alinsky Center has been called by a Washington Post magazine columnist, the second most conservative man in the world for his widely recognized uh, advocacy of the gold standard. And then we have David Alinsky, the son of Saul Alinsky and the chairman of the Alinsky Center, famed architect of a new kind of political strategy. So we'll start with the um, resolution. Let me pull it up here. Resolved that Saul Alinsky, the famous community organizer, was a, revolution, was a revolutionary neo-Marxist, and many of America's problems today can be traced to the destructive legacy of Saul Alinsky, mentor to Obama, Hillary, and the so-called thuggish wing of the Democratic Party. And we'll start with Inesh D'Souza, 10 minutes for that resolution. Yes. Thank you very much. Always fun to be back at Freedom Fest. And uh, today I have my work cut out for me. Um, it's a very awkward topic for me to be debating because we're debating the Alinsky legacy. And right here on the podium is the son of Alinsky and also the head of the Alinsky Foundation. So I kind of feel like I'm debating the legacy of Don Corleone, and here's Michael Corleone up on the stage, as well as the chief consigliore of the Corleone family. It's, it's a little bit awkward. I'll have to try to get, get over that one. At the first glance, it would seem very difficult to debate two people who are so intimately familiar with Alinsky. What could I possibly know about Alinsky that, let's say, his own son wouldn't know? Uh, but I think that if we look very much at the example of the Godfather itself, you realize that very powerful people can have one public life and a completely different private life. The Don, for example, was himself a family man, uh, very devoted to his wife, very straight-laced in matters of sex, very devoted to his children. And so my, here my point is that being the son does give you a certain privileged position, but you're also not going to see the man as he relates to the world. You're going to see the man as he relates to you. And it's quite possible that Ilinsky was a lovely family man, a devoted father, while at the same time in public life being kind of a gangster and a crook. Now, my, my case on Ilinsky really relies on three links in a chain, and to defeat the case you have to break one or more of those links. The first link in the chain is simply to say that common experience tells us that the Democratic Party today is completely different from the Democratic Party of, say, 50 years ago. In other words, the Democratic Party today is not the party of, let's say, Harry Truman or John F. Kennedy or even Jimmy Carter. The Democratic Party today is the party of Obama and Hillary, to a lesser degree, the party of Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. It's a different kind of party and something or someone made it that way. Now, that's the first link in the chain. The second link is simply to say what are the distinguishing features of this new Democratic Party? The old Democratic Party seemed to be a patriotic party, generally committed to the same goals as most of us in this room, but the difference was over the means, what to do with American prosperity, for example, how to share it. Or, yes, America should be strong in the world, but is it better for America to be more or less interventionist? These were debates about means, but agreeing on the ends. The new Democratic Party, I would say, is characterized by three new features. First, a kind of rather systematic deployment of lawlessness in public policy. 
And so, for example, the immigration laws say one thing, but Obama does another thing. The Defense of Marriage Act says one thing, but he does another thing. Obama, in a sense, literally sees himself as above the law. The law is a tool. The second feature is a willingness to use the power of the state against your opponents. In other words, we live at a time where even the post office, the Bureau of Land Management, all these places have SWAT teams. And so for the first time, I think this new Democratic Party uses the power of the government, of the IRS, of the EPA, to not only enforce its will, but to bludgeon its opponents into submission. You get on the wrong side of these guys, they think nothing of, of sending the, the tax audit people after you. This is the new Democratic Party. And the third feature is enriching yourself by shaking down private corporations and the government. Obama and Hillary are both sort of global specialists at this. They figure out how to use leverage to public power to, in a sense, rent or sell public policy. And they also figure out how to enrich themselves enormously in the process. Obama was a community organizer, but you won't find him around any poor people these days. He's hobnobbing with the billionaire set. Bill and Hillary came to Washington, D.C., and despite having government jobs all their career, they have a net worth of $300 million. Even Saul Alinsky died, interestingly and tellingly enough, in Carmel on by the sea. Uh, a community organizer who lives by the beach. And um, you may say dies to the sound of the waves. Now, this is the new Democratic Party. How to get that way? I think the simple answer is it got that way, not entirely, but largely, through the influence of one man, Saul Alinsky, and the influence he exercised independently over Obama and over Hillary. So another key link in my chain is that Hillary and Obama were both at a formative time of life shaped by Alinsky. Now, Obama never knew Alinsky, never met the man. Alinsky died in, I believe, 1972. But Obama kept going back to Chicago. Why? to study under the Alinskyites. He even became a kind of Alinskyite instructor. And so I'm suggesting that he learned his scamming techniques from the Alinsky way. Hillary met Alinsky in high school, uh, had a close relationship with Alinsky, brought him to Wellesley College where she was a student, was later offered a job by Alinsky. And so both Obama and Hillary, I think, at a, a key time of life, imbibed, you might say, the Alinsky Kool-Aid. Now I want to talk a little bit about that Alinsky Kool-Aid to see if it is recognizably the force behind, the destructive force, I would say, behind the America we live in now. Most people think that to figure out Alinsky, you got to go read the rules for radicals because, gee, there's the dedication to Lucifer on, in, in, in one of the opening pages, and that tells you all you need to know. I think that that book actually tells you relatively little about Alinsky. First of all, the dedication itself is highly problematic. Alinsky was an atheist, probably like a good many of you in this room. He didn't believe in God, and naturally he didn't believe in Lucifer. So why does a guy who does not believe in God or Lucifer dedicate a book to the guy he doesn't believe in? Clearly, this is not about Alinsky saying, I want to be the devil. Clearly, something else is going on. Remember, Alinsky himself embraces Machiavelli, and one of Machiavelli's key pieces of advice is not to play your full hand up front. And so you can be fairly safe in assuming that the Alinsky book is not going to be the full and true window into Alinsky. You have to look someplace else. Normally, we would have no place to look, but happily, toward the very end of his life, Alinsky gave a series of interviews. This was in 1971, 1972, really in concluding in the year he died. One was to Playboy magazine, a very detailed interview, and another one was uh, to Harper's magazine, I believe. In any case, in these interviews, Alinsky basically said stuff that had never appeared in public or print before, and they give you a real window into Alinsky. The first thing he says is that from a very young age, I tried to figure out how I could get stuff for free. 
without having to work for it. And he describes with great relish a scam that he, he developed at the University of Chicago for eating in dining halls without paying. And not only, now a normal guy would be like, I pulled off the scam, I'm a very clever guy. Alinsky, and we see the Alinsky method kicking in right here, is he said, I began to hold seminars around the university to instruct other students in how they could eat without paying for it. In other words, I think this was the birth of community organizing in the United States. Um, Alinsky then graduates from school. He goes on to college. He studies criminology. And very interestingly, he then gets in with, the, with a series of gangs, an Italian gang that he talks about, uh, and then, most significantly, the Al Capone gang. And here, Alinsky is very interesting because he talks about his interactions with the gang. At one point, for example, the Capone boys want to bring in an assassin from out of state to kill people. And Alinsky, far from objecting to the killing, objects to the high price of bringing in a, an out-of-state assassin. He tells, the, he tells the Capone guys, why don't we hire one of the local guys? They'll do it for less. Alinsky then tells Playboy in the inter interview, he says, you know, he goes, I really admired the way in which these gang members could shake down people and extract money and stuff out of them. The only downside is that every now and then they got shot. They got knocked off. So Alinsky goes, it got me thinking about how I could pull off a similar scam without the risk of getting knocked off. And then Alinsky realized that crime is actually very similar to politics. And so Alinsky realized, and again, I'm not divulging Alinsky's private thoughts. Alinsky says a lot of the things that I applied to community organizing, I learned from the mafia. That is not a direct quote, but it's a paraphrase of a direct quote. So essentially, Alinsky took the mafia's shakedown tactics, which is essentially up against the wall, pay up or we're going to get you, and brought them into politics. And here we have really the beginnings of Obamaism and Hillaryism. I want to give a, sim sim a simple example of how this kind of thing works, and that is since we're talking about it, Obamacare. So many people think Obamacare was Obama colluding with the American people against the insurance companies. That's the public face of it. It's a very Alinskyite scam. Let's pretend that I'm on the side of the people fighting for the little guy against the big bad insurance companies. Now in reality, something completely different is going on. Obama is meeting behind closed doors with these same insurance companies and basically using threats and incentives to bring them over to support Obamacare. The threats are obvious. We're going to be taking over the healthcare system and it's going to look very bad for you if you oppose it. The incentive is more cunning. Obama says to the insurance companies, we're going to be forcing millions of Americans, including young people, lots of people who don't want insurance, don't want to buy insurance, we're going to make them buy it. And that's hundreds of millions of dollars in profits for you. So you have a carrot, you have an economic incentive in backing my program. So here's my point. This was smoke and mirrors. Obama is in fact in bed with the insurance companies, establishing government control over the economy, one-sixth of the economy, while pretending to be on the side of the little guy. This was really Alinsky's specialty. Alinsky's specialty was to indulge in the rhetoric of social justice, while in fact, being about what he even talks about in his book, ultimately for him it's about power. It's about power. In this country today, there is a great fight over whether or not the entrepreneur, the creator of wealth, the people who actually work and make stuff, should they have the power or should an outside group of self-anointed bureaucrats and experts who declare themselves to be progressive on the side of history, on the side of the future, do they get to kind of come in and take things over and deploy wealth ultimately for their own gain, for their own private gain? This is the Democratic Party that we have now. Frankly, if you don't like Trump, this is how we got Trump.
The reason that we got Trump is the Democratic Party became a party of ruthless Alinskyites. The Republican Party is a party of bespectacled gentlemen. And these gentlemen were constantly being thrown up against the wall, defenseless against the Alinskyites. And finally people said, we need to have a little bit of a big boss and a little bit of a thug and a little bit of a guy who can throw you across the room on our side for a change. Remember how defensive poor Mitt Romney was about his wealth. Trump has far more wealth, but no one even criticizes him for it because you can't criticize him for it because the more you criticize him about it, the more he boasts about having even more than you thought. So we are now in a Alinsky-eyed environment. Quite frankly, I, I admire Alinsky from a distance. He was a very scheming, clever man. Uh, he was an interesting man. And I think perhaps it is the accident of history because he had no way of knowing at the time that his two protégés, you know, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, both of whom seemed to have virtually nothing going for them at the time, in fact, had nothing going for them at the time, would actually become, reach the summits of power. But they did. And that's what put the Alinskyite method into operation. And it's a big legacy although, I'm sorry to say, a destructive legacy. Thank you very much. Uh, Ralph, and uh, you know, it's interesting because there's a little inspiration in Trump as well as Hillary, but talk a little bit about why, um, why you think that that's not the case that uh, inspired the thuggishness and also maybe some dogmatic things about the neo-Marxism. Hi, Ralph Benko. Wore my black hat just in case there was any dubiousness about how far right wing I am. My biggest problem with Dinesh is he's so far to my left, when I turn in his direction as I see pink. And he certainly uses left wing victimiz victimizing tactics in his shtick. And Dinesh, shame on you. Saul died in Carmel by the Sea, where he was taking care of his ex-wife, from whom he had had a friendly divorce, not dabbling in the wave, not dabbling in the waves. He had a heart attack while he was there caring for her. But this is typical Dinesh D'Souza confabulation of Saul Alinsky's legacy. Barack Obama was 11 years old when Saul Alinsky died. They never met. I spoke to, I interviewed a friend of mine, Arnie Graff, who took over the industrial area foundations and who mentored Barack Obama for about two days or a week at a seminar. Barack was mostly interested in how Arnie was raising a racially mixed family because he himself came from a racially mixed family. But ultimately, he turned away definitively from the Alinsky message of community organizing to give power to the people against the government and the oligarchs, telling Arnie, I want to go into the system, I want to become a powerful political figure, a judge or a lawyer. Hillary Clinton met Saul Alinsky two or three times, wrote her honors thesis about him, turned down an opportunity to work with him because she said, I think Saul is magnificent, but you can't take this to scale. I don't want to put pressure from the, from the community on the government to carry out our will. I want to become a powerful central planner. She explicitly, in her thesis, which by the way is brilliant, and I strongly recommend you go to the web and read it, turned away from Saul Alinsky. Neither of them were Saul Alinsky's acolytes. Both of them turned away from Saul Alinsky. So Dinesh, trying to hang the corruption of the modern left and the Democratic Party on Saul Alinsky is just factually wrong. You got one thing absolutely right and I hope everybody was paying attention. Saul Alinsky was all about power. 
taking power. People think they know Saul Alinsky because they saw the wise guy Lucifer epigraph. And by the way, Lucifer, according to Martin Luther and John Calvin, was not Satan. In Jewish theology, and by the way, Dinesh, you're wrong. You, you made a misstatement. Saul Alinsky was not an atheist. He was an agnostic and a Jew to, till his dying day. You say these things, they're not factually based, and you confuse people. The left, Saul Alinsky was one of us. He was a classical liberal in the British sense of John Locke, Adam Smith, and the left has appropriated his identity and his work, which I will summarize you with one paragraph from Rules for Radicals, but don't be fooled by the, by the excerpts of rules. Don't be fooled by people who may or may not have read it, but are, that are circulating garbage. It's not dedicated to Lucifer. It was dedicated to his beloved then wife, Irene Alinsky. This was an epigram with an epigram, which David will talk about, sandwiched in with an epigram from Rabbi Hillel and Thomas Paine. David will talk about that. He never said that the ends justify the means. Read the chapter. He asks explicitly, what ends justify what means? It's very nuanced. And what did Saul Alinsky really stand for, live for, spend his life dedicated to? He lived an open life, Dinesh. There was no cover story in Rules for Radicals. It was a summation of the way he lived, which you could actually read about in Let Them Call Me Rebel by Sandy Horwitt, who lays it out chapter and verse. Here's a man with no secrets. And this is what he stands for, this is what I stand for, and this is what I pray you'll use your power to do. We learn when we respect the dignity of the people that they cannot be denied the elementary right to participate in the solutions to their own problems. Self-respect arises only out of people who play an active role in solving their own crises and who are not helpless, passive, puppet-like recipients of private or public services. To give people help while denying them a significant part of the action contributes nothing to the development of the individual. In the deepest sense, it is not giving, but taking, taking their dignity. Denial of the opportunity to participate is a denial of human dignity. I yield the rest of my time to our chairman, David Alinsky. First of all, can you all hear me? First of all, let me also stop for a moment and talk about the house in Carmel. A lot's been made of this. That house was bought from my, for my father for $35,000. The house had what was known as a life perpetuity clause on it. For those of you who are attorneys, life perpetuity means that the owner, the former owner, has the right to live in that house as long as he or she shall either live or choose to. We bought that house with that idea in mind. My mother, Jean, died in that house of multiple sclerosis. I'm sorry that I have to talk about this. There are a lot of things that were said today I don't have the time to go into all of them, 
but I do want to talk about a few things. There are three basic myths about my father. Well, first of all, let me also say that I'm not here to tell you amusing stories about our times around the dinner table or the times with our guests and friends. I'm here to talk about the philosophy and the theory of my father. There are three basic myths about my father. The first is the book is dedicated to Lucifer. Ralph touched on this. The fact of the matter is, is that that page in the book, if you look at it, is called a frontispiece. There are three notations on that page. One by Rabbi Hillel, who died in 110 BC, a little while ago. The second is by Thomas Paine. And the third is by my father. He talks about Lucifer. All right, who was Lucifer? Historically, he's a metaphor for evil inclination. In the Hebrew, it's Yetzar Hara that exists in every person and tempts them to do wrong. This is from Genesis 6-5, if you want to look it up. The word Satan comes from a Hebrew verb meaning to oppose or to obstruct. And he certainly intended to do that, to oppose or obstruct the establishment the reference to Lucifer is not about doing evil, but rather than rather opposing the accepted status quo of the haves at the expense of others. The second myth is that his philosophy and tactics was based, biased toward the Democratic Party. This is also not true. While he uses the word democrat or democratic, a number of times in the text. He never says that this is for the Democrats. This is for any organization, any people, any group, as a series of signposts on how to think about power politics. And let's face it, we are all involved, one way or another, in power politics. If we agree with each other, fine. If we don't, we're looking for ways to convince or to otherwise obtain that power for the good of ourselves, for the good of our community, for the good of our nation. His interest was solely in providing a means, a way of thinking and organizing for all people, whether they be black or white, yellow or brown, American, Native American, or any other, any other group, including libertarians. People regardless of color, origin, or politics, with no political power to gain for themselves a sufficiently meaningful measure of political influence that they could see a path forward to attain for themselves that measure of freedom, security, and independence that the haves have always exercised and have taken for granted as their birthright. The third myth is that he was a communist, Marxist, socialist, capitalist-hating, God-hating anarchist whose sole mission in life was to destroy the republic. Nothing could be further from the truth. If anything, he was a committed capitalist who believed that it was only through self-interest that individuals and groups achieved anything. Why work hard, he would say, when in a communist system, working hard achieves nothing 
and it's only the party leaders who make out. Everyone else were just slaves. Anyway, he would say, I could never be a communist or a socialist. They don't have a sense of humor, and that would be deadly. He used to say he would never join any organization, not even his own. But that's not exactly true. He was a Jew. He said, I value my, high, my independence too highly, but, but the organization he did belong to and supported was that of the Jewish faith. He was a member of and supported our neighborhood temple all of his years. I grew up in that temple. He would never have sent me to synagogue if he had been anything less. And when asked, would say, I'm Jewish. That's what he would say, I'm Jewish. That's not exactly the sentiments of a God-hating Marxist. There were a lot of things that were said today. I really don't have time to go into them. But to say simply that what he believed in, in the book, Rules for Radicals, that's his soul speaking. I will tell you one thing, that sitting in, the, in, in our apartment, he would work long into the night, struggling over each word, each phrase, each sentence, each paragraph, to find the essence of what he believed and what he wanted to work for and what he dedicated his life for. He was a Democrat, there's no question about that. He was a lifelong Democrat. However, more than being a Democrat, he believed in the Republic and the ability of people to organize for themselves regardless of their party, regardless of their community, regardless of their race, creed, or color, to gain for themselves the individual and collective rights that our country, our country provides. Thank you. Very heartfelt statements. We're sort of running low on time here, so we're going to do a, a quick response by Dinesh, just a few minutes, maybe responding to that, and maybe a closing statement, followed by a very brief two-minute closing statement by Ralph, and if, if David is willing. Alinsky um, was a complex man. I think it's interesting that Virtually none of what I said in my opening statement has been even really challenged by Mr. Benko or Mr. Alinsky. Um, I guess they want to quibble about whether Alinsky was an agnostic or an atheist. Quite frankly, I'll, I'll concede on that point. He was culturally a Jew. He was not particularly religious. He said so himself. Uh, and maybe he wasn't strictly speaking an atheist. He was merely a, I don't know, agnostic. Fair enough. That's not the heart of the matter, though. The heart of the matter is, is it true that Alinsky really had this impact on Obama and Hillary? I mean, we've seen a kind of weird defense of Alinsky's legacy by Mr. Benko. He seems to say that you can't call Alinsky's legacy destructive because he didn't really have a legacy at all. Neither Obama nor Hillary paid any, paid any attention to him, really. Uh, I think that's not true. It is true that Obama and Hillary developed a serious shift from Alinsky. If you will, they broke with Alinsky at the end, but they broke with him on one point and one point alone. Essentially, Alinsky was an outside man. In that sense, my mafia analogy of controlling the street through intimidation is very apt. Alinsky used the outsider shakedown technique. Obama and Hillary went one better. They said, wait a minute, we don't have to be outside threatening to bring the government to a halt, threatening to shut down a corporation. What if we run the corporation? 
What if we run the government? Then we can use the weapons of the state which we otherwise wouldn't have against our enemies. So yes, Obama and Hillary, you may say, out alinsky Alinsky. And they use state power in a way Alinsky never dreamed was even possible. That's the first point. Now, with regard to whether or not Alinsky was a leftist or a rightist, let's just put it this way. Once you start talking about the haves and the have-nots, and you treat the haves as if their success, their earnings, their created wealth is all somehow accidental. In other words, something that is merely power that rained like manna from heaven on their heads and they are ruthlessly trying to protect it. And the have-nots as the victims of social misfortune who now must organize and struggle to take from the haves, we are now in a straight out Marxist class division of society between the haves and the have-nots, let's remember that the whole of the United States was invented to, as an alternative to this framework. The United States was based on the idea that if you limit the size of the government, you avoid the kind of oppression that was common and systematic in feudal Europe, and you allow something kind of new in the world, which is wealth creation. People work hard, people come up with new ideas and patents and copyrights, people invent things, they create wealth. Am I a have or a have not? Well, when I came to America with $500 in my pocket, I was most definitely a have not. Over time, through effort, by selling books, giving speeches, making movies, I guess I'm now a member of the haves. So was, is, the, is Dinesh now an oppressor? whereas the old Dinesh was a wonderful potential Alinskyite. This is a kind of shallow leftist way of dividing society, never asking the question, was this wealth stolen or created in the first place? Now, to give Alinsky credit, he was a very ingenious man, and he figured out very creative ways of making his point, which essentially put the Republicans typically in a very bad light. At one time, Alinsky, for example, was approached by a group of leftists who wanted to, to protest the Republican Party by holding up posters saying the Rep Republican Party is the party of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, Alinsky is a very smart guy. He would have known for sure that the Ku Klux Klan was, for almost the entirety of its history, an organized element of the Democratic Party. The progressive historian Eric Foner says, for 30 years, the Klan was the domestic terrorist arm of the Democratic Party. Alinsky knew this. But what advice does Alinsky give to these young leftists? He says, listen, don't have posters, because that's the usual leftist claptrap. He says, all of you come dressed as Klansmen. And then when the Republican speaker begins to speak, you just jump up and down and cheer wildly so that you have created a media event that makes it sound like the Klan loves the Republicans. So here's a classic example of straight-out deception, historically invalid, in fact, the opposite of the truth, a big lie if you want to use the term of my new book. But Alinsky had this uncanny ability to realize that you could use the big lie effectively to extract concessions. Even when Nelinsky would protest against private companies, he'd find out that they're sponsoring, for example, a concert, Masterpiece Theater. Alinsky would say, all right, let's pay 500 guys to go in the theater, and when the performance of classical music starts, all of us will begin to cough and fart. Why? To disrupt and destroy and ruin the performance. The company will be so embarrassed at this that they will then, behind closed doors, we don't even have to do the protest. We'll just threaten to do it, and they'll pay us off behind closed doors before the event even takes place. So, in conclusion, if you see a tone of brutality, incivility, intimidation, um, a, a smoke and mirrors, deceptive propaganda, if all of this is now the regrettable features of our culture, where on earth does it come from? We can see the nucleus of this in Rules for Radicals. Alinsky didn't just do it, he was actually proud of it. Thank you. Ralph, uh, two minutes.
Dinesh, I didn't, dis I didn't completely dispel your premise because life is not long enough to dispel all of your innuendos and misstatements. And Saul Alinsky concealed, carried a sidearm because of death threats from the KKK. You continue to distort the message of Saul Alinsky, which doesn't bother me. You're a house cat. You sit on a pillow and you drink cream. And you consider alley cats like Saul Alinsky and me riffraff. I get it. And you earned it. Saul Alinsky had nothing against earnings. You're making all of this stuff up. Read the book if you don't agree. I don't have an, enough minutes for this. I have one minute to tell you that the number is 56. Not for you, Hitchhiker's Guide fans, 42. What translated the Declaration of Independence from just one more document and Rules for Radicals is cut from the exact same classical liberal cloth as the Declaration of Independence, was 56 men who pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to the proposition that the Creator has given us certain unalienable rights and it's the government's job to defend them. There must be hundreds of people in this room and thousands of people in Freedom Fest there are people at Freedom Fest, like Mark Skousen, like Steve Forbes, like George Gilder, who have pledged their lives and their fortune and their sacred honor. We need more of you to stand up and not criticize the government, but take power now. Thank you very much. And, uh, David, if you'd like to make just a, a less than two minute closing statement. That's a challenge, two minutes. What we're talking about here is means and ends. Like I said before, we're all involved in one way or another with power politics. And the question is, if you are being oppressed for whatever reason, from whatever source, what are your means of fighting back? And what is the end you wish to attain? Communities like in Rochester or in the south side of Chicago, in New York, in Canada, what did they have? They didn't have the power. They didn't have the political power. They didn't have the money. They didn't have the police. They didn't have the laws. What did they have? They had themselves. So. You use what you have with what you've got, period. We all know this in our businesses, in our lives. You use what you have, you use what you've got. So what did he have? He had people. So he could send a couple hundred people to the Rochester Symphony Orchestra. Or he could send a couple hundred people to O'Hare Airport in that famous story. You use people. Was he working outside the system? Yes, he was working outside the system. How could he work inside the system? They weren't in the system. The system was oppressing the people and they had to find a way to fight back. Means and ends. You use what you have with what you've got. It's as simple as that. Thank you everyone for participating in a heartfelt discussion. I'll just end with this quote from Saul Linsky, which hangs in my office. Actually, it's Thomas Paine, Saul Linsky, quoting Thomas Paine. Linsky not concerned about his reputation at all, saying, quote, let them call me rebel and welcome. I feel no concern from it, but I would suffer the misery of devils right to make a whore of my soul. Saul Linsky. Thank you everyone for participating in this.